Thank you, Simon. Okay, so I just want to start um, by giving you a story about um, computing in general, or, or what it's like as computer scientists today. We are still quite in the dark, as you can see here. Um, about 30 years ago, we had the 386 came out, which was, was a pretty slow device. It was about 12 to 40 megahertz um, in speed. At the time, it was fast, yes. Relative terms, it's very slow. Um, about 10 years later, the kind of the clock speed started to, to kind of ramp up. So we're getting clock speeds of about 300 megahertz. This was uh, the introduction of the Pentium. It's one of the first chips that I, I started to program on. The dawn of kind of th this century, they kind of ramped up even further to about into the gigahertz. So we're kind of looking at 3.6 gigahertz. This is a Pentium 4. Um, 2006, so about eight years ago, the clock speed hasn't really changed. We're still kind of about three gigahertz. So, but what has changed is we're getting more cores. So instead of the single core, we're now getting a dual core. And a couple of years ago, we're kind of starting to get six, eight cores. This is very common now in desktop machines, but still the clock speed is, is almost the same, still about three three and a half gigahertz. Um, so what does 2004 look like? So this, this thing here is, is what, what we call a Xeon Phi. It's a 60 core x86 chip. You can actually buy these, they're off the shelf. They're very cheap. So this, this one device contains 60 cores. That's, that's, quite, that's quite an increase from the six that we had two years ago. Um, Last week, I, I was on Google, and, I, and I, I decided to see what kind of the, the current hardware trends were for, for kind of tablets and mobile devices. This is what we call an AMD Mullins. It's very interesting because it, it only has four cores, so it doesn't have 60 cores like I've just shown you. But if you look at, look at this, this diagram, there's lots of real estate on the chip that's kind of devoted to lots of other very specific things. So we have a lot of the, lot of the, um, the chip, the orange bit, is just for graphics. We have um, certain devices for, for encoding video, for, for, for networking, lots of memory. We have interfaces to connect them to other chips and so on. Um, this kind of thing is, is very powerful because it still has lots of processes we can use. So this example, the graphics core alone has something like 128 cores. That's double what the 60 core processor was that I showed you previously. And these kinds of things are, are very, very common in gaming devices, so things like Xboxes and things like that. They're very cheap. Um, they consume a very low amount of power, so only just over four watts can power this thing. So you get huge um, computing power for very low power consumption. But what does the future like? So this is the present, but what does the future like? So what, one thing to think about is, is, is we're kind of going exponential in the number of cores. But perhaps we, we'll see a system with a million cores. I wonder if that would ever happen. Perhaps it will. Um, and what, what we'll probably see is not millions of very large um, x86 type cores, but probably lots and lots of very small, very dedicated cores. So lots of hundreds of thousands or millions of very, very small um, processes. They're probably not just going to be scaled versions of today's multi-core. Um, you probably get a kind of device that maybe has hundreds of dedicated inter integer units. Um, again, hundreds of floating point units. So this is kind of like a GPU, but perhaps a bit more enhanced than a GPU. You probably only have a very few heavyweight cores. So only a very small amount of the, of the computer will be um, taken up by very kind of heavyweight general purpose cores. Um, and we'll still get specialist units for graphics, uh, networking, authentication. We may even get some soft cores, so these programmable kind of hardware you see a lot these days, like FPGA. But the kind of the, the, the real message is they're going to be massively heterogeneous. So they're not just going to be um, one type of core packaged in a chip. They're going to be hundreds of different types of cores uh, packaged together. Um, it's probably not going to be uniform shared memory. Um, Abstractions like shared memory and global variables is just not going to work. But of course, we all know that because we're Erlang programmers, of course. Um, 
these things are just not going to be compatible. Even message passing um, just won't work. This is just an example of, of a machine, or two machines that we have access to at the moment. The one on the, on the left here is called Lackey. It's, it has 32 nodes. Um, it has a Xeon 5560 2.8 gigahertz. And the one on the right, it's called Hermit, has 3,552 nodes. Each node has something like 113,000 cores. This is absolutely enormous. Um, I don't think anybody has managed to kind of find an, an application that actually uses kind of even a, a small percentage or one core, uh, one node on, the, on this machine. Um, so these, these kind of machines do exist, these huge mega core machines, but nobody knows how to actually use them or to program them. Does anybody have an idea what the fastest computer in the world is? Anybody have the slightest clue? Yeah? Yes. So the fastest computer is actually, um, surprisingly, well not surprisingly, it's um, located in China. And it has th over 3 million x86 cores. It's, um, it, it, it comprises something like 16,000 nodes, has three of those Xeon Phi's in it. And over 3 million um, heavyweight general purpose cores. It's absolutely huge. I wonder what it's being used for, Craig. <laughs> I wouldn't like to say when I'm on stage. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay, so it's not just about the large systems. So, okay, that's great. We've got systems with millions of cores, but I don't think that's really the only thing that's important today. So everybody here, I'm guessing, has a mobile phone. Everybody has a smartphone these days. Although I spoke to somebody yesterday who still had a, an old Nokia brick in his pocket. I was quite surprised at that. Um, this here, for example, here are Samsung and Sony phones. Um, typically contain about eight cores, four of which what we call dark, so they switch on and off depending on the, on the energy and the, the application usage. Um, these are great because you get great energy trade-offs, but you still get decent performance. Um, and basically, we're seeing a world where the only thing that matters is parallelism. This is the only thing that's kind of emerging and really coming forward. Um, if we don't solve this challenge, but no matter what we do everywhere else, it just won't matter because we'll be so far behind that we'll never be able to catch up. So this talk was about really about programming heterogeneous systems. So what, how can we kind of combat this? How do we, how do, we do this now in Erlang? Um, th there are things like bindings exist, so very low-level bindings that we, we need to use to program these heterogeneous devices. So one such kind of binding is one that I've taken off GitHub. It's actually a very nice binding. Um, it basically wraps up OpenCL in Erlang, so you can kind of call OpenCL directly from Erlang. Um, the user is required to provide a kernel that's written in OpenCL. You can generate some kind of kernels very simply, but it's very limited to what you can do, um, translating it from Erlang directly. Um, it provides all of the setup and offloading and things like this. You need to get the, get the GPU or whatever going, but you still have to do this yourself. Um, and you still have to require all the parameters, and, and, and you have to convert things to pointers and all this kind of horrible stuff. This is just an example of, of what this kind of code looks like. It's not very functional at all. I'm sure you can agree. We kind of have to do some setuping, then we have to, get, we have to build a kernel. We have to find where the kernel is. We have to create loads of buffers. We have to set whether they're read or write only. We have to find context. We have to work at byte sizes. We have to set kernel arguments. Um, we then have to read, uh, sorry, in queue buffers. We have to then wait for the device. I've massively simplified this. The actual code was something like three or 400 lines just to call a very simple GPU kernel. But this is a kind of very low level um, programming that people need to use. So programming at this very low level is extremely difficult. I'm sure everybody hopefully can agree with me here. Um, these kind of mainstream programming models like OpenCL, uh, CUDA, pthreads, even Erlang processors are, are just too low level. Um, I'm, I, I, I say here for an average programmer, but I think even for a programmer who's an expert, they're too low level. They're really difficult to get right. Um, and not just the fact that they're, they're low level and fiddly, but 
many applications don't just have one way to parallelize them. There's lots of different ways you can parallelize most applications. So spending days, weeks, months writing these incredibly low-level um, OpenCL or whatever applications, and then you find out there's a better way to parallelize it. You have to completely write, rewrite the thing from scratch. It takes another three years or whatever. And choosing which of these the best parallelization to use or to exploit is, is incredibly non-trivial. Um, doing it trial and error, so just trying and uh, just, just keep trying the, the different parallelizations in turn until you find the best one is going to take you forever. Um, it's, it's a very costly technique. So what do we want? We want basically a way for people to think in parallel. Um, this really requires completely new high-level programming constructs. So um, high-level in, in the sense that we need to deal with hundreds of millions of threads, perhaps. Um, you can't program while worrying about things like deadlocks. You just have to get rid of them. And the same with communication. You just can't deal with communication. So Erlang is nice because it's concurrent, but you still have to deal with processes and communication. This is too low level. Um, you also can't possibly program these things without any kind of performance information. You can't drive a car without a speedometer. Well, you can, but you probably crash into a, a brick wall or something. The same, same with this. These, all, all these things need to be included and abstracted. Um, people need to get into this mindset from the beginning that they're really thinking in parallel. So what we have is a project called Paraphrase, which is a, um, a three, three and a half year project. It's, it's comprised of 13 partners across Europe. Um, notable partners are Erlang Solutions. Uh, we've got AGH, Elta, and Eltasoft. Um, there's various other, other partners across Europe, um, some quite large industrial partners, SCCH and Mellanox. Uh, it's co coordinated by Kevin, who I think is sitting in the audience somewhere. Um, and and our, our idea in Paraphrase is, is to completely change this low-level approach. So it's about trying to, to think of a way to think in parallel. And the way we do this is instead of starting at the top, we start at the bottom. And by that, I mean we first identify components in our program. So what are the things, what are the units of work that we need to deal with? These are kind of the lowest level of, of um, entity like in parallelism. Um, and we're using, I'm going to show you, we're going to use some semi-automatic refactoring techniques to kind of do this kind of stuff for us. So even th just thinking about components is not enough. We're going to provide tools that allow people to identify and introduce these things into their code. It's about thinking about the pattern of the parallelism. So it's not about thinking in terms of spawns, receives, pids, all this kind of stuff. It's about thinking about structure. What is the structure of the parallelism we're trying to achieve? Um, typical kind of patterns are things like map reducers, I'm sure everybody is aware of. Um, and then it's about structuring these components to make a parallel program. So taking these low-level components and then slotting them in to the pattern that we want. Um, and we're going to take performance, energy, et cetera, all into account. And we're going to do this using tool support. And then possibly we might need to restructure. So once we've, once we've formed a parallel program, we might think, actually, there's a better one. Or we're not using this type of architecture anymore. We're going to use a different one. So then we can just restructure it. And this is all done using tool support. And we're doing this for both legacy and for new programs. So this is not just. We're not just taking kind of our own contrived examples here. We are looking at quite complex legacy applications. So this is kind of the, the, the power phrase um, high-level approach, if you like. So what we've got at the top, we've got sequential code. And here's Erlang. We're also looking at a lot of other different languages. So we're not just targeting Erlang here. Our approach is, is a general one. It's not um, constrained to a particular model or paradigm. Then in the middle, you've got the sausage machine, the power phrase sausage machine. You've got some uh, parallel patterns here. You've got some things like performance information coming in here. And then at the bottom, you get some parallel code. You get parallel Erlang or C. So you put Erlang in here, you get parallel Erlang out. Um, and then you've got some kind of big heterogeneous system you want to run it on. So you, then you map it to the, the available resources. Yeah, so what, what, you, what Kevin said is you can't put C in and get Erlang out. but. Um, not yet. 
So what this sausage machine in the middle is a refactoring tool. So this is a, a tool that allows you to take your, your sequential code and introduce kind of annotations or patterns to get to the parallel version. So what do these patterns look like? Um, these are just a few examples. This example here is, is a task farm. The idea here is you have kind of some, some units of work coming in, and then you farm off the computations onto different cores or devices. So each of these W will execute on a, on a different machine or a different thread or process or whatever. And then you wait for them to finish and you gather and, you, and so on. Uh, this is reduce. So it's very similar, but the, op the operation is a binary one. So, you, so each time you get two inputs and then you, you execute that and then the result of that goes to the next stage. And you can kind of do these in parallel, each stage in parallel. The pipeline is like a function composition, but in parallel. So imagine you've got a number of functions, you've got some stream coming in here, you apply the first stage to the, to, the, to the unit, and then you pass the result to the second stage. So while that's computing, the first stage can get the next result, and so on. So these have been around for a long time. There's nothing new about these parallel patterns. They've been around since, since the 80s. Um, Google MapReduce, I think, is probably the most common example of a parallel pattern. And that's simply just using a combination. So it's simply just using a map uh, combined with the reduce. So there's nothing really complicated about map reduce. Um, so generally, we need, to, we need to nest and we need to combine all of these types of patterns together to form a complete kind of system, a complete parallel system. Um, so we've done this for Erlang. We've created a skeleton or a pattern library for Erlang. It's called Scale, um, and it implements um, lots of these parallel patterns, you can kind of think of them as like pluggable templates. So you, you, you want a particular type of parallelism, you just choose the one you want, and then you just plug your bits in. Um, it's, it's fully nestable, so you can nest different patterns together. Um, it's like a DSL for parallelism, is one way of thinking about it. Um, you can download it here. The, the general API is, is very simple. Um, you just call a, a function do in the module scale, you pass in the type of pattern you want. This is kind of a nestable thing. And then you pass in your inputs. And it handles all the parallelism for you. And it's completely implemented in Erlang. There's no magic going on here. It's not, it's not calling C or anything. It's calling Erlang processes in the background. But it just provides a nice high level, higher order uh, interface to the parallelism. So these are example. This is just a pipeline, just what it looks like. Um, here is kind of like an example of how you would construct a pipeline using scale. You would call do, um, but you'd pass in, at the top level, you'd pass in a pipe. And then you'd, for each stage, you then construct a new skeleton. So this, this tuple here is a skeleton. And then you can, you can pass in nested skeletons into the middle. And then you pass in uh, um, some inputs. And the values in this input are basically streamed to the stage. So they're streamed to the first stage. And then when this is finished computing, its result is streamed to the next stage and so on. So you kind of get this, um, this kind of streaming workflow. Another example of a skeleton is a farm. Um, this is like a data parallel kind of pattern. This is an example of how you can construct one. It's simple again. You just have do, and then you put this time you have a farm, and you pass in your scale, your, your particular skeleton. Um, M is the number of workers, so you want to have um, more than one work, I, I hope, to get some parallelism. And then again, you just pass in your inputs. So these are kind of your top level units of work. Um, so just another example of constructing farms. There's something else we need. So I mentioned to you before, we have this notion of a component. So this is the unit of work. This is the, the computation we want to do in parallel. And we can simply wrap that in what we call a seek. So the seek stands here for sequential. We can just wrap a call to our, our function, the, the thing that does the work in a seek, and then we can just embed that in a farm. So seek is like a, it's like a sequential skeleton. So here we have a farm with n workers, where each worker calls worker, the function worker. And then we can just wrap that in the do, where we pass in, this could be a list or, or something like that. Yeah. And using the right type of pattern really matters. So here's just an example of some, some kind of performance results for matrix multiplication example. What we've got going along up the top is a speed up. So this is the number of times faster against the sequential version. 
And what we have going along the bottom are the number of cores we have running. Um, the blue line is, <coughs> excuse me, is an Erlang implementation not using skeletons, so it's just using spawns and receives. Kind of a very naive way of implementing this. As you can see, the performance is not very good. So which, which kind of shows you that just spawning things is not really the right way to get parallelism. It's great for concurrency, but it's not a parallel way of doing something. And it kind of falls flat. So you kind of get the speed of about two, and then it gets a bit, little bit more, about four and 16 cores, and then it falls down again to about two on 24 cores. So you're kind of not really using that 24 core machine very well. The, the, the one in the red line is just a task farm. And as you can see, it kind of races up to about speed of about 16. And then it kind of dips off and goes up to about uh, just under 22. And then we can try a different type of pattern. This is one with just simply uh, a chunking where you, you group tasks together. So just a different type of pattern. And you can then get slightly more performance, so almost, almost linear. Um, the reason we get a dip here is because it's a NUMA architecture, so you get um, two lots of 16, oh sorry, two lots of 12. So there's just a little bit of overhead copying data over. That's, that's a hardware issue rather than the patterns. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I basically wanted to, to describe to you just an example of how we can do this the right way. So how we can take an example, a sequential program, parallelize it using our skeletons, showing some refactorings, and possibly showing how we can put some of the work onto a GPU. An example I'm going to use is an ant colony. Um, <clears throat> it's basically this, this diagram is the only thing that you need to look at here. The idea is, is you start, um, you do some decomposition of, of some value, you pass it out to a number of ants who then go away and find some solution based on that. Once they've finished, you collect. You collect all of their solutions together. You then pick the best one, so you pick the best solution that they give back, and then you repeat. So you give that best solution back, and then you, you feed them out to the ants again. And you keep repeating and repeating until some um, predicate is matched or some, some way of, of solving the solution is met. Okay, so it's quite simple. It's basically just a bit of a function composition with, with a loop, a bit of recursion. This is kind of what the basic sequential code looks like. Um, what we have here is just a top-level function and colony. It takes some parameters. You don't need to read what this does. It's not important. The only thing that matters is, first, we, we, we get some results. So we, we call our ants. The results of that goes into the variable results. We then pass the results into a next function called pick best, and so on and so on. And then we call um, ant colony again. So we call it recursively. Okay, so it basically it's a one-to-one -one correspondence to, the, to this diagram that I've just shown you. Nothing, nothing special. So what we're going to do is we're going to use um, what's called refactoring. As Simon gave an excellent presentation yesterday on, on refactoring. And we're going to use Simon's tool, Wrangler, which is um, an Erlang refactoring tool. This is just an example of the screenshot. This is Wrangler embedded in Emacs. Um, it, refactoring is basically a way of, of restructuring code so that it doesn't change what it does, or specifically for our purpose, it doesn't change its functional uh, behavior. And it's an idea that you can kind of refactor and review your code and then keep, keep changing it. So you can keep restructuring it automatically uh, with very little effort. Um, <clears throat> so parallel refactoring is kind of a new approach to parallel programming. It allows you, well, we think it allows you to think in parallel because it, it really guides you through all the steps you need to take to get from your sequential program to your parallel one. It provides a database of these, these parallel transformations you can just apply. It can give you things like warning messages, so if, if you're doing something stupid, it, it will tell you. Um, obviously, you can't apply patterns that don't fit and if they don't fit. Um, you can use things like profiling, performance information, and integrate this into the tool to let it, let it kind of guide you through the steps. Um, <clears throat> and it's much more structured than just using spawns everywhere, which is not really a very structured way to program, I don't think. Um, it helps us get it just right. It's a much more functional, nicer way, cleaner way of writing parallel programs, I think. Uh, this is just an example. So here we have very simple kind of list comprehension. So we have a list inputs. For each element in the input, we pass it into a, 
um, a function composition where we apply F3, then the result to F2, and then to F1. So we can take this code and refactor it into a, a parallel pattern where it simply introduces a pipe, and then it, for each of these function calls, they just become stages in our pipeline. So this is kind of one click, and you get the code on the above, and it transforms into the code on the bottom, and it's parallel with one click. And there are, there are many of these, these um, refactorings available. They're all, I think, in, in Wrangler now. You saw that the, the version of Wrangler you download, I think, includes all of these. So things like pipe introduction, uh, they all have elimination, so you can introduce and you can remove the pattern if you don't want it. So the basic patterns, pipes, farms, maps, chunking, all these sorts of things are available. Um, and they're also undoable. So they're not just reversible, but Wrangler has a, has a, a really nice undo feature. So if you make a mistake, you can just revert. So let's go back to our example. Um, so here we've got our ant colony example, and we want to introduce parallelism. So how are we going to do that? Um, well the first thing we're going to do, the first thing I notice is we've got a dependency here. So results of this passes into the results of the next stage. So this is like a pipeline. So I'm simply just going to select this, this bit of code, and then I'm just going to introduce a pipeline. So I can do that and then I get this code as a result. So this is the result of the refactoring tool. What it's done is introduced a new definition called pipe. It simply uh, wrapped up the call to the function that I had before, but it's, it's created a little fun to pass in the parameter. And then the next stage, it, it's, it's the other function. So it's just basically wrapped these up into a parallel pipeline. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is, is I want to farm these because I want to get some more parallelism from this. So then all I have to do is simply select this, this top level um, seek, this bit here that I'm highlighting, and introduce a farm. And I can simply do that just using the factoring again. So then I get to a farm here. Number of CPU workers that calculates for me. So I don't, need, I don't have to do that. Um, the rest of the code remains unchanged. Um, but what about the recursion? There's still the recursion is a problem, so I still need to deal with that. Um, but that's okay because there exists a type of pattern called a feedback. So I can simply just select the recursive block and transform it into a feedback. And what this does is it takes the pipe, the thing that I introduced previously, and once the pipe is finished, it basically recalls, calls it again until this, this function condition is met. And it also introduces the function um, condition, which, which it, it derives from the, the base case of, of the ant colony function. So it's, it's done all of this automatically, and the only thing we have to do next is just to instantiate this. So we just make this a call to do, calling, uh, passing in our feedback and the parameters, and then we return the result. So all of the stuff in red that, that the refactoring tool has introduced for us. Uh, we haven't had to type any of this ourselves. So what kind of performance do we get from this? Uh, quite decent. So again, the, the, the bottom line is the number of cores on the machine. The, top, uh, the line going up, up the top is the speed up. Um, what we get is a kind of uh, a speed up going up to just under 10 for 12 cores, and then again up to about 14. Um, and then it kind of tails off again. So quite good, I think, considering all we've done is just clicked a few buttons, selected a few patterns, and we instantly get pretty good speed up, I think. But what about the heterogeneity? I haven't kind of, I haven't kind of told you about this yet. Um, what if we were to take this farm and make one of the workers um, offload it to a, to a GPU instead of a CPU? So we can have a mixture of workers in our farm. Some are working on a CPU, and one or two are working on a GPU together. Um, but that's okay, we can do that as well, because we have a new type of heterogeneous farm. It's exactly the same as, as the old type, but we differentiate it by a seek CPU or a seek GPU. And you simply need to supply um, the worker, the GPU worker. Um, and you can wrap these like you did before, so you can build a farm where you have some CPU workers and some GPU workers together, together with some input, just like you did before. Um, but more than that, we're going to use refactoring tools again to kind of generate this. So this, all this OpenCL bindings that I showed you right at the start of the talk, 
you can get all of this for free because the tool can just generate this. Um, what it does is, is, is it uses tools underneath, like dialyzer to get types and things um, of, of kernel arguments and things like that. And then it just generates all of this OpenCL bindings. Um, at the moment, you still have to provide a kernel, um, but perhaps that will change at some point in the future. But it eliminates all of this horrible, tedious, and very error-prone writing of OpenCL, I think. Um, we also have a static mapping technology that kind of um, derives the optimal number of workers, so the optimal amount of CPU and GPU workers you need to give a farm, so you don't need to, you don't need to worry about that. So let's go back to our, our result, uh, sorry, our example. All I need to do is just take the farm, this time I'm gonna make it a GPU, um, but I call a different function, it, it, it generates a new function, GPU solve find solution, and that function cr contains all of the OpenCL generated code um, and calls the kernel. So the result of that is much better. Um, so what we've got now, going along the bottom of the number of um, what are called symmetric processes, symmetric multiprocessors. These kind of correspond roughly to the number of workers. Um, but it's a bit odd on a GPU. Um, the, the 30 here kind of corresponds to one worker. It's a bit backward. Um, and and going, going down to one corresponds to, I think, to eight. The, you, can, you can get um, an illusion of number of workers on a GPU by changing the, the local and global address spaces. Um, but I don't want uh, to to bore you with that because the tool will do that. What's interesting though, if we look at the speed up here, we're kind of getting a speed up now of about just under 30. So before we had a speed of about 14 and now we've got a speed up of 30. So we're kind of really utilizing that GPU architecture. Um, so the, the, the kind of the whole point of this is we're really trying to get to a new kind of methodology, a new way of thinking about parallel programs. Um, the idea is a program would start off at the beginning, they start off with an application. It may contain parallelism, it may, con may not contain parallelism, it doesn't really matter. What is important though is they identify some structure. So they identify maybe it's a sequential structure, like I did with the ant colony, so maybe it's a function composition with some recursion or something like this. They then try and they then figure out from that initial structure, what kind of pattern they want to apply. So they've got kind of a database of patterns they can just apply to it. Um, these are all available, so they, they can apply one. But, more, but they don't just do this blindly, because we have performance information that we can use to filter to get kind of some of the best or some of the worst uh, configurations that are, that are clearly useless or clearly going to be better. So we can immediately just eliminate kind of half of them. We can then apply our, our static mapping, which gives us the number of workers, so it gives us the number of GPU and CPU workers for each configuration. And then we simply use the refactoring tool to choose, oh, I want that configuration with that number of workers, and it instantiates the program, and then we run it. Okay, very simple. And if, and if it turns out it's not the best one, we can simply just go back. So now we go back to here, and we choose a different configuration, a different mapping, a different refactoring. And we've instantly got a new parallel program that might work better. If you're porting it to a different architecture, it might be better for that, for example. Uh, so just an example of this static mapping that I've mentioned. This uh, is another example, uh, image convolution. What we have here is, 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 is only the structure that I'm, I'm interested in. We have two stages. We have an R and a P. So we read an image, and then we pass that image to a, to a function that processes it. So it's just a simple composition. We first generate all the configurations that we can apply, so all the different types of patterns or the refactorings we can apply to this. So we get lots of different ones. Here the delta is a farm. The, the circle is just a normal sequential composition. The parallel bars are pipeline. So here, for example, we can just farm. We can take the composition and just farm it. We can farm the first stage and then compose it with the second stage. We can take the first stage, compose it with a farm of the second stage. We can farm both stages. We can make a pipeline. We can make a pipeline with the farm in the second stage, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, I mean, it's kind of almost an infinite number of possibilities you can, of parallelizations you can apply. 
And this is what we have here in this table. So here we have the different configurations. And this is using uh, performance information and profiling. We can kind of estimate what kind of performance we're going to get from this. So we can estimate the runtime. And as you can see, there are a number of uh, configurations that are clearly going to be better than the other configurations. So some of them are going to be terrible. Uh, composing, so the sequential version is obviously going to be terrible. It's going to be five and a half seconds. If we have a pipeline, it's going to be slightly better, 3.8. Um, if we farm one of the stages, we get sudden massive increase to 1.6, kind of three or four times faster, and so on. The best one is, is if we farm both stages with a pipeline in the middle, we get something like 0.4 seconds, which is about uh, 12 something times faster. And then when we run this, what, what we can observe, so here we've got, um, along the bottom, we've got the number of CPU workers in the first stage. Uh, going up the top again, the speed up. Um, but what we've got, each line corresponds to a different number of workers in the second stage. Um, so we put the second stage onto a GPU, we put the first stage onto a CPU. And each line corresponds here to a different number of GPU workers in the second stage. Um, and using our mapping, we can kind of get almost, almost to the op most optimal solution. So here our, our mapping um, predicts you want six CPUs in the first stage, three GPU workers in the second stage. And where the star is, you can see um, it's a speed up of 39.12, but the best speed up was 40.91. But it's, it's, almost, it's almost the best. But considering you don't have to do any work to get that, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of to just to start to conclude. Um, <clears throat> I hope I've kind of really motivated that this many core uh, revolution is really upon us. We're no longer living in a sequential world anymore, I don't think. Um, so hardware is really changing very, very rapidly. Um, kind of in the last 10 years, it's really, really increased its speed of change. And we're already in the mega core era. So we already have machines with millions of cores. Um, but most of these mega core machines or heterogene uh, have heterogeneity, and energy is very important because we're starting to get, with, with smartphones and tablets, we don't want to be using energy, so we want to be using more of these small um, chips rather than the very heavyweight general purpose ones. And programming these things at the moment is just too low level, so concurrency techniques don't work for parallelism. You can't use a concurrency-based system to get massive parallelism. You can get kind of two or three two or four speed up or something, if you're lucky, on eight cores after kind of a few days hacking. But you just, you're just you not going to scale it. It's not going to work. Um, you need to expose mass parallelism. And the only way to do that is to work at a structured level, not at a process level. Um, so we think patterns, and, and particularly functional programming, really help with this abstraction. So having this nice functional higher order way of dealing with parallelism is, is great because you can c control the parallel structure, you can control the threads, um, the workers, the offloading, everything for you. Um, again, you, you can control side effects, particularly in Erlang, so you, can, you have more ways of controlling what things are going to be done in parallel. Um, you can abstract a lot of the detail away. You can avoid so many problems. Um, generally, as well, if you, if you can identify a sequential structure, the parallel result will always give you this, the parallel version will always give you the same result uh, because it's correct by construction. Um, and automation is very important. So having these refactoring tools really dramatically increase, uh, d decreases the amount of time you spend in development. So you're not spending all your time learning OpenCL bindings. You're not spending all your time trying to get them to work, working out how to marshal data, how to offload workers. You're not spending all your time working out What's the best number of workers I need here? What's the best number of workers I need there? And if all the tools do it for you. So you kind of have a big toolbox of um, different things you can use to get the results you want. Um, and that's basically more or less all I wanted to say. Just one, one note before I finish. Um, we, we are growing a user community for Powerphrase. So if, if you're interested in what you've heard today, there's, there's a lot more that we have going on in the background. It's kind of just a teaser talk, really. Please join our mailing list. Um, 
You'll get all of the news items. You'll get access to all of the software. We also have C++ software as well as Erlang. So everything I've said today works for C++, if that, that you're interested in that. You can chat to the developers on the project. You can go to developer workshops. Um, you can help us track bugs and fix them, which is really important. Um, you can Skype at this address. And we're also looking for people who would help us develop these tools. So if you're open source developer and you want to help us, please get in touch. We're really, really pleased to hear from you. Um, but that's, that's basically it. So thank you very much for listening. Good. We've time for a couple of questions. Anyone? Yes? Thanks a lot for an exciting talk. Um, the question I have is, you showed one of the last uh, pictures. I think that was about ACO. And we're talking about millions of cores. And then you had a benchmark up to 30 cores. And still the uh, be best like performance that go, uh, you've got was in four cores. So I was wondering, any thoughts on that? This? Yes. This is what you're talking about. Yeah. So what we have here, it's, it's the, the diagram is a bit. The, the the graph is a bit complicated. So what you have going along the bottom is the number of workers in the first stage. So what we have here is a parallel program where we have two stages, which is um, each stage is in a pipeline. So we have a pipeline with two stages, and each stage is a farm. So, the first, so what we have going along the bottom are the number of CPU workers only in the first stage. So what, what you can see here, so this yellow point corresponds to we have four CPU workers for R, and because it's red, we have three GPU workers for P. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, and, and it our, is. Yeah. Yes, but you were talking about um, mega things, you know, mega cores, and you have 16 uh, <laughs> workers over there, and still the best one is. So it's like. Okay, well, we have to start somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the point is this: I mean, this is scaling. Just, I mean, even to get 40 speed up is, is still quite <coughs> impressive in today's standards of parallelism. I think. Better, for example, and we, we need to do that later. Sorry, so I'm shouting. Uh, but when we have three million cores, we can use the same techniques to, for example, say, well, we'll choose the one million core system that works better uh, with the appropriate number of GPUs, etc. So we're, we're demonstrating the principle. And we certainly hope that we're going to be using at least the 113,000 core machine within the next year. We hope that's going to be running Erlang, and next year we, we hope to be able to give you some results from that. That we're very close to your million, I hope. So, um, in your one of your first benchmarks, you talked about Numa and that there was a, like a dip yes. in performance. Mm -hmm. How do you address Numa problems in your pipelines? Um, so that would probably come down to the implementation of the pattern. So. The, 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 the pattern wouldn't change, so the structure wouldn't change, but the implementation would. So you perhaps have an optimized implementation of the pattern that would work for NUMA. Um, but our principle would still hold. You'd still apply the same pattern at the top level. There's only the implementation would change. So a programmer wouldn't have to think about that. They would just choose, oh, I'll choose the NUMA pattern instead of the... Uh, okay, so you yeah. hope to solve the NUMA, NUMA, too, NUMA yeah. problems too, okay. Um, related question on just uh, processor architectures. So, um, for example, with C++ or Java, you can set threading affinities with various libraries. You can set scheduling affinities. You can use NUMA control task set to get good process affinity with the parallelism. In Erlang, we don't have those kind of runtime features. What two or three features would you like to see in the Erlang runtime so that we could better exploit parallelism in this way? Um, okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, Yes, I mean, I think, okay, so, I mean, there's a trade-off with having a system like Erlang because it does all the scheduling for you, but it has uh, the, the limitations where you can't control what's happening as much. Um, I guess one thing, w one thing that we've experienced up to now is, is memory usage. That's a big problem. 
in Erlang. Um, but but we're, we're figuring out ways to combat that. Um, so I guess, uh, not quite sure how to answer your question yet, but <laughs> perhaps we could, I don't know, one day we'll have the answers or we could talk later about that. Sorry, guys. Um, it seems like the um, you know optimized number of uh, workers, and also this is about refactoring the code. Yes. So it seems like you optimize the code for specific target systems. Yes. So you would have to refactor if you switch between the two yes. different mega systems that yes. you used. But that's better than rewriting your code from scratch. Oh yeah, of course. So. Yeah. So, are there any plans of having it runtime in any way? Any, sorry, I didn't. Of understand. having these optimizations, like the number of, of workers and stuff, in runtime? In the runtime, yes. I mean, so one part of the project deals with dynamic optimization as well as. So we, here, what I'm showing you is static optimization. We're also dealing with with new virtual machine methods that deal with dynamic optimization. And what they will do is they'll take the component model that I showed you briefly. And then they will use that to optimize the, the uh, optimal load or the optimal balance of, of components to the underlying machine. And then they will do this dynamically. So at one time, they, will, they might change or they might offload different workers to different available hardware. So this time next year, we might show you that if it's working. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank Chris again. Let's thank Chris again more loudly. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks.